Thank you for having me. I mean, it's super exciting to come and talk with you guys who are like the visionaries, right, in this space and really thinking about what kind of learning opportunities really enable young people to grow themselves in ways that matter for our world now and into the future. Um, and so as I, like honest truth, since you're all educators, you understand, you know, the process. So I'll unpack the process a little bit. I would never say this to a group of neuroscientists, okay? Just to be clear, I would never say this. I was, I was getting ready to get up, like literally five minutes ago, and I was like, you know what, I'm kind of bored. I'm sort of sick of, I'm sort of sick of this. I've been saying this a lot over the last couple of days because I gave a couple other talks. So I just took my whole talk and flipped it upside down and made the back, at the, made the end the first part. And we're just going to totally turn it around and see how that goes. Is that okay with you? Okay. Um, it might mean that my timing is not exactly going to end us exactly on time. But if you want to go eat lunch and you think it's boring, be my guest. All right. Okay. So, so I titled the talk Solving the Frankenstein Problem, which I honestly took from my good friend David Daniel who's way smarter at thinking about cool ways to say stuff than I am. Um, because the idea here is that so often when we think about science of learning or evidence base in education, what we're actually talking about are these very narrow constructs, we like to call them in psychology, things that we as scientists have decided are a thing. And we decide that basically by what we can measure. And then when we can measure a thing, then it's a thing, and then we have to do something about it. Does it sound familiar, right? Does that sound like really not that useful when you're actually faced with a room of, of real people, you know, young people who want to engage, who want to think, who want to grow themselves, who want to know the world, who want to know themselves, right? And so, what we often do in science, too, and this is great because it teaches us a lot about how things work, is divide the person into all these separate capacities. We divide people into you know, any number of ways, right? We can say, how much uh, grit do you have? How much, um, you know, how, how, how well does your super marginal gyrus engage in phonological decoding, right? You, you can do all this stuff and say, nope, not well, you've got dyslexia. You know, you can start to carve the person up in the name of evidence, but then teachers are left and school designers are left trying to stitch all those things together, all the emotional experiences, the cultural ways of knowing, the neurobiological uh, you know, variability and diversity that's natural across the species, the interests, the proclivities, the desires, the, you know, the, the talents, trying to bring those all together and make not like some kind of monster that's sort of stitched together in the middle, but like a real person. And so my talk today is about the science I do and other people do, right? I don't do it alone by any means, right? That attempts to try to understand from the whole person perspective. What can we learn about people and how they engage in the learning process in developmental ways and what that might mean for schools and for teachers in their own developmental process in ways, right? Because you're all human beings too. Um, and then think backwards, sort of back map onto, well then what could we be doing that would leverage this new developmental knowledge about neurobiological development, psychosocial development, cultural development, intellectual development, civic development, as dimensions of one person, not as separate pieces of a person or separate, separate um, you know, activities that they engage in. So that's the way that I'm gonna frame the talk. And I also wanna say from the very beginning, um, you know, I used to teach seventh grade, <laughs> right? So I mean, like, by all means, like, raise your hand if you have a question or if I say something that's not clear or something. If um, that said, if I, I have to take a minute to get to you so I don't lose my train of thought in my old age, you know what I'm saying? Or if I'm worried that we're gonna to get to it in a minute and I'm gonna get behind, then don't be offended. But by all means, we can make this a conversation, okay? So I'm turning this around. There we go. But before I start, I just wanna kind of set us in a neurobiological frame of mind. And so, so often when we think about the brain or biology, especially in educational settings, but actually not even, like in neural settings too, like, okay, 
if I go to the Society for Neuroscience or something, we think about biology as being a separate thing from the person, and we often tend to think of it as kind of deterministic. Right? If you understand the biology of something, then you understand it. And that's wrong. <laughs> it, it's wrong in demonstrable ways. And instead, I like to think about the brain like this painting. So this painting was done by a colleague of mine and friend, Margaret Lazari, who was the chair of the fine arts department at USC until she retired recently. Um, and she and I met on the bus, public bus one morning going to work, and we were talking about what we each do at USC. And I was saying about my work and trying to understand young people and how we make meaning and teaching and learning spaces and all that. Um, and the biology, cultural, social, cognitive, you know, aspects of all of that. And she was telling me about how she's trying to understand through art, through creativity, right, the kind of codependence, the dynamic inner dependencies and relationships among biological forms of life and humans in our world, the sort of ecological perspective on our biology and our minds and our creative processes. And so we realized we could actually do something together, which is very um, generous to me because she did all the work. But basically what I did was gave her some of our neuroimaging data um, from a brave you know, person who went in our MRI scanner, which you'll see a little video of that later so you'll know what it looks like, um, in our MRI scanner, and we took pictures of her brain and then we, we peeled off the outside of her brain all the cortex, right? All the you know, little cells that do the firing, you know? Um, and, and we peeled those off. So we peeled them off the picture, not off the woman. Just want to be clear. <laughs> you never know what people think we do. Um, and, uh, and then what's left is this picture of the white squigglies in the middle of this seascape of life. It's basically billions of microscopic, fragile little tails of salt water that are conducting electrical signals around the space of the head and all the way down into your body to the ends of your fingers and toes and back up again into your head again to make you an entire organism, to make you whole. And we are only just beginning to understand the dynamics of the sort of development, the functioning, the interdependencies of the ways in which these literally billions of little tails of salt water are connecting with each other, are modulating each other's activities in these grand patterns that turn out to support the dynamic whole nature of us. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our data around the ways that these, these, these networks are co-regulating one another throughout adolescence. And, uh, and at the end, we won't have time, but if you ask, I can maybe be coerced to talk a little bit about how they're activating in teachers. We've been following really excellent teachers from uh, low SES, high, uh, you know, high crime environments in, uh, in the LA region. We've basically been going into high schools and asking uh, the administrators, who are your superstar teachers that the kids love, that the kids go to, that the kids learn with? Um, and then we've gone to those people, and they've been incredibly gracious to allow us to actually study them, study their brains, study their, hook them up like little Borg all while they're teaching, and have their kids do homework and shunt it to us, and then we give it to them on you know, the internet, and then we give it to them in the MRI scanner and ask them to give feedback. And like we're looking at what does it look like to do this work well as a teacher? What are the developmental capacities that teachers, de that teachers you know, cultivate to be able to do this work well? Um, and so, you know, what I love about this painting as a place to start, I mean, in real life, it's this incredibly vibrant uh, seascape, right, which never shows up well on slides, so I feel kind of bad for Margaret. But, um, you know, what you can see there is that the connectivity, the dynamic connectivity of our biology is not just sort of like in the corner in a bucket where we can put on our special scientific glasses and study this thing, right, and then we, then we know everything. Right? Instead, it's sort of sloshing back and forth, literally being bolstered up and you know, sloshed around and floated by all the environment around us. And she's got like, you know, little weeds tickling the bottom. She's got little red fish swimming by to represent the spontaneity of our creative ideas. She's got um, you know, 
kind of the warm sunlight shining onto one side and the cooler earth coming up on the bottom. And that is how our brains develop. We literally are functioning in concert with other people. Our biology is a deeply cultural one. You cannot separate one person's brain from their body, from the bodies of those around them, from the minds of those around them, and understand what's happening. We are deeply ensconced in developmental opportunities to interrelate with one another, and it turns out our work is now showing how the patterns of thinking and feeling that we subjectively engage, the ways we make meaning of the things we witness, those patterns of meaning making and of emotionally relating and of making sense actually allow us to predict into the future the development of young people's brains. Above and beyond IQ, above and beyond family socioeconomic status or even their parents' education level, the way in which young people dispositionally engage with complex issues and stories when we show them to them allow us to predict their brain development. And in turn, the brain development. So let me be very clear. I don't mean what kind of brain that kid has. I mean how that child has grown their brain from age 15 to age 17. So here's Mary Helen at age 15. Here's Mary Helen at age 17. How has Mary Helen's brain changed? That change predicts young adult happiness. Right? It's kind of like if a kid came to you and said, Hey, Ms. Simordino, which is what I used to be called when I was a teacher. Um, you know, I'm going to join the, the, the running team in the fall, right? Or, hey, Ms. Simordino, I'm going to join the swimming team in the fall. No matter the, the talent in sports that child has, no matter their current level of physical fitness, if they actually join the swimming team and go to practices, or the running team and go to practices and do it, you can make some predictions about how their skills and their strength and their fitness and their, and their body is going to change differently over the next three months, right? It's like that. Thinking turns out to be an activity that grows us over time. And that growth changes not just how our brains function in the moment, which we can actually demonstrate empirically, but actually also changes the structure that supports those thought processes. We can actually show that the networks, these white sloshy things, are thicker in certain places and stuff in kids the more dispositionally curious they were. When we asked them, hey, here's this girl in Pakistan, which you'll see that, right, with this group called the Taliban. Never heard of them? Okay, right? So here's what happened. How does her story make you feel? Depending on how they engage with that, we can predict how the structure of their brain will change going forward. And that change produces the substrate for mental and intellectual and civic health and relational health. It produces, it allows us to predict how much a kid at, in young adulthood says they like themselves. Says, like, these opportunities that I'm engaging in right now, whether it's work or school or whatever I'm doing at age 22 or parenting, right? is what I always hoped for myself. I like my close relationships, the, my partner or, or friends, like whatever it is they choose to talk about there. And their, I, you know, Erickson's identity coherence, right? The, the sort of achievement of self-actuation is higher by their own report. And they endorse less things like, you know, I don't really know what I stand for. I just kind of go along with what everybody else says, which is bad for you. So it's the stuff we really care about that kids' patterns of thoughts and emotions are allowing us to predict. That's a powerful, powerful statement about the role of education in young people's lives. It's also a really powerful statement about what kinds of opportunities in educational settings invite young people to engage in the kinds of dispositional ways of becoming curious, thoughtful, relentlessly engaged in understanding that actually set them up to develop mental and, and emotional habits that our data suggest are good for them over time and good for society over time.
in communities, okay? So let me see what comes next. Yeah, I'm not even sure because I'm like, I moved everything around. Okay, yeah, 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 all right. So I'm just throwing everything out the window. My student over here, Emily, my PhD student who's going around with this, she's like, oh my God, Mary Helen. <laughs> okay, so don't, don't copy this, Emily. When you give a talk, don't do this, all right? Okay, great. You know, start with getting confident and then you can, all right, great. Anyway, I thought let's just start like this. You've been watching, walking around, seeing all the amazing educational stuff that's going on here. I'm gonna start by sharing with you three scenarios from classrooms, okay? Inner city, low SES classrooms, very different. Some of them we pulled off the web, some of them we are from our own, uh, our own um, the teachers that we're working with whose administrators identified them as being really super, okay? And here's what I want you to do. I just want you to ask yourself, how is this teacher's practice promoting learning? What kind of engagement is happening here, okay? In, in all, I think you'll find that in all the cases, the kids look super engaged with what they're doing, right? I'm not interested in showing you what really poor teaching looks like. We all know what that looks like, okay? But there are deep differences in the dispositional ways kids are engaging with ideas. So I want, I've kind of given it away there, I want you to watch each one and think, and then you will turn to your partners, you people at your table, talk for a minute, about what you see in it. What are the emotions? What are the emotions about? What kind of engagement are we witnessing? <laughs> so that was one class, right? Obviously, I should have said at the beginning, that was like a, a civics lesson. They were practicing for the exam at the end of the semester, okay? So another class, this is a math class, Algebra 2, okay, and I'm just gonna Hit it, let it go for about a minute. The goal for today is being able to explain compound interest because that goes back to them meeting their financial goals. The students did a lot of work on calculating retirement, mortgage, and um, college education costs. I had a financial planner come in to talk about financial planning so that they can understand how to become a financial planner for the families that they were helping. For days they wrestled with their assigned families' financial situation and had to email back and forth to get more information and clarification. So on one side they're looking at these very complex mathematical principles of exponential and they have to switch that and make it conversational in a plan that a lay person can understand and not get caught up in the calculation. The cost of your home is 140000 to the principal interest and that's going to be the payment for to pay it off in 25 years. Okay, so I want you to ask yourself how well the goal for the sorry, how well do you think this teacher's practice promotes learning and how are the students engaged? One minute. So, obviously, there was a lot of emotional engagement in both of those classrooms, right? But the tenor of that emotion is quite different. We're going to look at that in the brain in a moment, okay? One more? Oh, one more? Okay, this is English language arts. Um, and uh, so this, this, uh, this, woman's, uh, this uh, woman's class is about to write commentaries, and so they're trying to help She's trying to help the kids come up with ideas for their commentaries. So my goal today is to really get them to think about how they might go about coming up with an idea for a commentary. So I'm brainstorming about what stories we all carry with us that are worth telling. And you'll see on the board over here, um, we are going to be talking about three phrases that you are all going to answer based on your personal experience. People will often say to me, I don't have a story. That's not true, everybody has a story. There's some really interesting things written up here. Let me read them out loud. I care about loyalty. I care about love. I care about making good art. I care about reforming the foster care system. Yeah, Heaven? I like that one because I was in the foster care system. Tell us about, why'd you write that? I wrote it because I was like, I was actually born and raised in foster care and school would be one that I want to change. Well, I think it's a great tool for social engagement, for civic engagement, because we often have a perspective we want to share and we want other people to empathize with us. 
Okay, one minute. How well do you think this teacher's practice promotes learning and how are the students engaged? Go. Really quickly, anybody want to call out? What do you notice about the relationship between the emotion and the thinking in those different classroom vignettes? The last one of whom is apparently a high tech high former teacher. <laughs> yes? I felt like getting them, especially this last clip, getting the students to be emotionally vulnerable and share, yeah. getting them more engaged in the learning and connecting. What do you mean by emotional engagement and connected to the learning? Did you think the first kids in the first clip weren't emotional engaged and connected to the learning? I mean, there was, it was just different because they were being very personal in the last one. So they were talking about themselves. Personal and about themselves. Yes. What else is different? I mean, obviously, I'm meaning to juxtapose the first one to the second two, right? Duh. Um, uh, yes? Uh huh. Yep. The students are owning the information in the third video, which is, I, I suppose, what you also meant about personalization, right? Because it's coming from you, right? Mm hmm. So, what does the teacher own in the third video? Yeah. I mean, you're not seeing it in this clip, but being teachers, what does she own? Yeah. Uh -huh. to allow students to socially uh, and emotionally share out their personal experiences. Mm -hmm. how, yep. How does that relate to learning English and how to write a commentary? You have to be comfortable sharing your stories with others. If you're going to write and put yourself out there and expose yourself, you have to feel comfortable in a space to do that. Because writing is about exposing yourself and putting yourself out there. So you have to be able to do that in order to learn to write, is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah? Other things? Yes? I think she gave the students an opportunity to really connect to their own story to allow them to be more creative in how they were going to write. Okay. Yep. So hold on to those examples for a moment, and then let's, we're going to look in the brain, okay? Because, as you might guess, there are actually fundamental differences, it turns out, in the dynamics of the neural network activity patterns, right, of those white things floating in the ocean, in different kinds of emotional engagement. So all thinking, all thinking is inherently emotional. Otherwise, you don't do it. The brain is incredibly metabolically expensive. It means it uses up a ton of oxygen and glucose compared to the rest of your body. Evolutionarily, we only use our brains to think about stuff that matters. It is neurobiologically impossible to think deeply about and hence to build memories about stuff that you have had no emotion about. So, you know, people say, well, that's not true. I studied fill in the blank thing, and I didn't have any emotion about that. I hated it, and I, I, I passed the test. Like you had no emotion about it, really? So here's the thing, and we'll come back around to this at the end. Really effective educational environments shift kids and teachers' emotions. Not, they don't make them more emotional. They shift what the emotions are about. In the first video, he, I mean, he's working hard, obviously. He's trying very hard and cares a lot about the kids, right? But the emotions are about the result, the outcome, the answer, right? The passing the test. But you do have to do those things. You do have to pass the test. You do have to know the stuff. Okay. But in the second and the third video, I would argue that the emotions are about the ideas being engaged with. So shifting people from emotions about results and outcomes to emotions about the idea. Because think about it this way. Whatever you're having emotion about is what you're thinking about. And whatever you're thinking about, you could then maybe learn about. 
So if your emotion is about the outcome, you're going to remember and learn about the outcome. If your emotion is about the idea, you have a hope of actually deeply sitting with the idea. Does that make sense? So let's look in the brain about what I mean. So I'm going to now start skipping around. Let's so see. Michael. Right. Oops, no. OK, here we go. So this is a little, <laughs> this is a little poem, song my daughter wrote, OK, for her baby brother Teddy when she was you know, in kindergarten, I guess. Don't read it unless you're like a kindergarten teacher. But you know, just literally a picture of a thing she did with crayon. There's a picture of her. And she, she's singing this little song, which I won't sing for you. I'll just read it, OK? She says, oh, Teddy, we love you more than the whole earth size. As the earth spins every day, we love you as much as usual. But sometimes even more, as you make us proud and happy, that you're you. Right. I have a simple question for you. Is this a song for this little girl's baby brother, for the love of her baby brother? Or is this a song about her budding interest in planetary science? <laughs> right? And now I'm happy to report she's actually in college studying like human planetary health and whatever, right? It's just like the icing on the cake that, that makes it great. Right? Our intellectual engagement and our relational ways of knowing and being are not separate in the brain. They are not separate. They rely on the same networks. So the same networks that are enabling you to know if you're digesting your lunch well are enabling you to know whether you find something fair or whether you find something important or beautiful or hateful. And the same networks that enable you to find things beautiful, hateful, important, and to know that your heart's pounding or that your lunch is sitting with you well, are also the networks that allow you to subjectively have a sense of your own agency, right? The networks that allow you to feel like this is me here doing it in my own life. So if kids' relationships are shifting the way they're feeling about themselves in that space, that is the same brain network system that is being trained up to think that way about math or to feel that way when you're expected to have agency in your own identity and your own civic engagement. They're not separate systems. So let's look at this. I'm going to skip this for now because we're out of because we did the other stuff first. OK, so emotions are automatic responses, right? You do not control, unless you are an extremely highly trained like Tibetan monk, you don't control your heart rate directly. The way you control it is by controlling your mind. So what that means is that the process of feeling, and this is going to be another important idea, the difference between emotions and feelings. We have all kinds of colloquial way of talking about it, but emotions are the reaction you have in the moment, okay? Feelings are the kind of narrative, the awareness, the subjective awareness that you construct of that emotion and why it's happening and how the world works and who I am in it. Those complex narrative processes are the substrate of brain growth and of learning. The way in which we construct a subjective awareness of having been somewhere turns out to be incredibly important for how the brain then learns whatever happened or whatever you engaged in or did while you were there. Context really matters. There's no such thing as like cognitive stuff separate from the rest of what you do. It is being engaged in. You know, you're not a Frankenstein monster, right? It's being engaged in through the feelings you're constructing of being there, engaging in it. And that makes all the difference to the way we think about designing educational environments that are meaningful for kids. So I'm going to show you a little clip, whoops, a little clip from a NOVA episode school, the future, maybe some of you. Um, if you can hit that, that would be great. But it gives you a little sense of how we're actually doing the work in the lab that I'm about to show you some of the data from. OK, so we actually talk to young people and about complex, you know, real, true stories about teenagers from around the world. And then we move them into the MRI scanner, 
which you'll see. And the, you know, the science is thinly represented here, but we're actually, they're hooked up to you know, psychophysiological recording. We're, we're measuring their heart rate, their galvanic skin response, like microscopic amounts of sweating on the bottom of their feet, and all these things that are indicative of embodied emotion. And then we're asking them to think about the stories again and to tell us how emotionally engaged they are in thinking about it, how much it matters to them at that moment, and how much they are really thinking about it versus kind of done and like, you know, not. And then what we do is we look at the patterns of dynamics in the body and in the brain that correspond systematically to the way young people and older people, we've done this with adults too, right? are experiencing it, and I mean that as a verb, are constructing awareness of what they're thinking about. And then we can show that five years later, this predicts what they remember. And in the interim, it predicts how they're growing their brains over time. So in other words, the subjective way in which you construct an emotionally engaged pattern of thinking with information is what determines how that information shapes what you then go on to do next, what you learn, and how you develop yourself. So let's watch. Maybe you can start it. Hey, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm Mary Helen. Nice to meet you. Since her days as a teacher, University of Southern California neuroscientist Mary Helen Imordino Yang has been interested in knowing how emotions factor into learning. I quickly realized that there was very, very little known about it, the kind of stuff that we really care about in education, like how people become inspired. How do we become interested in things? How do we build curiosity? And how can we support that process? <laughs> in trying to identify which parts of the brain are involved in the deepest and most meaningful learning, Imordino Yang works with teens from troubled neighborhoods. We're going to be watching stories. We really want to know what you think. So there's no right or wrong answers. These are kids who see a lot of crime. They see a lot of dangerous things. They see a lot of poverty. And we wanted to understand how do they make meaning of that world around them. This first one is a story about a girl who lives in Savat, Pakistan. And the city was being taken over and basically run by a group called the Taliban. Um, so I want you to watch her when she was 12 years old. First, she gets them emotionally engaged in a topic by showing them videos about people struggling to overcome adversity. I want to become, become a doctor. I want to become, become a doctor. So how does her story make you feel? Um, this story makes me feel upset how she wants to be a doctor and continue on with her education, but it makes her sad that knowing her journey would be very difficult. For adolescents, these types of stories can trigger moments of deep reflection. They come back from those kind of reflective moments with this heightened appreciation of the meaning of the story and what it applies to in their own life and what it means for the nature of the world more broadly. And it's crazy how it's that powerful. Whereas we've known that for a long time in education, the neural data are giving us new insights into the mechanics of that process. Come on over here. To find out which brain regions are harnessed during reflective emotion, Imordino Yang monitors the students' brain activity as they re-watch the emotional videos in an fMRI scan. How you doing in there? Good. So we're looking at the movement of the blood flow in her brain as she's watching the stories, and where in her brain is becoming more and less active as she's experiencing these emotions. She found that the reflective thinking caused by these emotional videos triggers widespread activity throughout the brain. The most high-level brain states that people experience in the scanner don't just activate high-level systems they also activate lower level structures of the brain that are involved in regulating and monitoring your consciousness and your survival. Imordino Yang believes that the reason why learning and emotion seem so intimately connected is because complex emotion, like admiration, can activate basic brain functions, like those regulating breathing, 
and heart rate. We think that the reason that humans' values and belief systems and ideals are such powerful motivators is literally that they're hooking themselves into biomechanical machinery that has evolved to keep us alive over time. So emotions are a critical piece of learning always. Meaningful learning, learning that really matters to you, that changes who you are and that endures over time, always has an emotional component. So you get a sense of what it looks like, right? So we're asking young people how they feel as they're thinking about things. So this is my little nephew, OK? Um, you know, what we find is that as people are reflecting on how, you know, what something means to them and reporting to us that they're deeply engaged with thinking about it, what we see is that they are ramping up the mechanisms in their own brain and even brain stem, like very low level stuff we share with alligators, right? that are involved in maintaining your own bodily survival and consciousness as compared to like coma, literally. And so what we're seeing is that as people are thinking deeply about stuff they care about, they're ramping up these systems for embodied awareness that are then shaping the way they, their brains grow over time and changing what they're capable of thinking about in the future. So let's look what actually happens in the brain. So here's a picture of a brain. This was the first study we did, which was with adults. Um, but the data you know, are remarkably reproducible with young people. The dynamics are less stable in younger people. No surprise, right? Stability is not something that adolescents are known for, right? Um, I have two of them at home, I know. Um, but uh, but the, the, the systems that are being engaged are, are not different. So, I'll just point out a couple of key, what we call regions of interest, right? It sounds like a, a crime thriller novel, right? Regions of interest in the brain that we were looking for when we first did these experiments, which were the first experiments ever to ask people, how do you feel thinking about this? How engaged are you with thinking about this? How much does it matter to you? And what we found was very interesting. So the first, you see what these pictures are, right? This is a picture through somebody's head this way over here, and then we took a picture this way and turned it up. So at the top here, you've got, uh, where's the thing, here we go. At the top here, you've got the forehead and the back of the head, right? So you're slicing right through the middle. And these orange spots are places in the brain, it's, 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 a, it's a statistical map, I've basically superimposed on one person's brain picture of all the places across many people's brains that people shared in common, and that's really important, right? that people shared in common when they said, I'm really deeply moved thinking about this right now. I'm very deeply engaged thinking about it, as compared to when they said, yeah, you know, not that interesting. I'm kind of done, right? Which, unbeknownst to them, there were actually stories mixed in that were not meant to be as compelling so that we could watch people move in and out of these deep thinking states. So what do we see here? First, we get massive activations in systematic places all the way down. We're now, we're up here, this is the tongue, the nose, right, the spinal cord. You're right above the spinal cord in the brainstem. This, you know, we share with all vertebrates. This is not high level stuff. But this is far below the level of conscious awareness. Thank God, or my 17 year old would forget to breathe and like keel over dead, right? <laughs> okay. These are the places in the brain where all the high stuff up here, the cortex we're so proud of having more of than apes and all that kind of stuff, right, is talking through down to the face and body through the spinal cord and back up from the body, right? Picture that, those white floaty things at the beginning, okay, in Margaret's painting, right? Through here, this is densely packed with little fiber tracts and nuclei that are the conduits for neural activity in the world you know, in the body to correspond to the world and to come back. Essential for survival. What we have in here, this is called a midbrain or the mesencephalon. You get damage in these regions here. You basically get persistent vegetative state, coma, right, or death, depending on the extent of the damage. You get damage down here in the medulla. This is the bottom of the field of view of the scanner, right, right above the spinal cord. We can't even keep you alive in life support. Short of defibrillating your heart with every beat, you become quickly dysregulated and you die, right? 
think how deeply this speaks to the, the shaping of one's own self and consciousness through the act of thinking about something you care about. These two regions here, which are one on either side, right? Because now we're up at the top where you've got two of everything. They okay, call the anterior insula. So I'll just tell you a little bit. So here's a picture of the insula, like from an anatomy textbook, you know, Gray's Anatomy, the, the textbook, though not the TV show, right? Um, uh, dumb joke, but it, you know, it has to be said. Um, so eyeball goes here, right? Neck goes down here, and they've basically respected the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the, uh, I mean, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe. And there's like a big crack in the brain right there. And the, you can just open it up and look under, OK? And what you're seeing is these big pieces of cortex now. This is the stuff we are proud of having so much more of than apes and stuff. What do we know about this cortex up in here? What we knew came basically from neurosurgery experiments from the 1950s, where a famous neurosurgeon named Wilder Penfield was trying to cure people who were dying of intractable epilepsy, right? People who were having electric seizures through those networks and so dysregulated that they were destroying their brains and were dying. So people were, not surprisingly, willing to be inv involved in all kinds of dramatic cure attempts to try to save themselves, and he actually was remarkably successful. But what he did was he would put people to sleep under anesthesia, open up their head, wake them back up again, and then poke around in the part of the brain where the seizure was starting, right? To, to, and ask them, like, you know, how are you feeling now? What are you doing thinking now? All right, talk to me, Mrs. Jones, right? And as they would do that, you know, they would say, oh, well, that's my left toe. Oh, you're tickling my left knee. Oh, that's my left thigh. And they'd be like, oh, wow, there's a map of the leg right along this lump, okay? And that is how we got the first maps of the alive, awake human brain before we had neuroimaging, which is really quite recently on the scene. Right? So what happened when Wilder Penfield poked around up in here? Person vomits or gets other kinds of gastromotoric, you know, responses, which I won't describe in polite company, okay? Right? What we knew was that that is gastrosomatomotor cortex. What we know now is that that same cortex is being concertedly more active when people report to us that they're thinking deeply about something they care about. We've done it with social stories. Others now, like Samir Zeki in London, you know, University College London and stuff, have done this with mathematics, for example. In mathematicians who are looking at equations that are either beautiful equations or ugly equations. And, and apparently, mathematicians know exactly what you mean by that, which already tells you something, right? They're all correct equations, but some have elegance and parsimony and describe powerfully you know, fundamental things in the universe, whereas others are true, but who cares, right? And he gets the same kinds of neural activations. Our embodied visceral selves and our knowledge and thinking about complex information are not emotion over here, cognition over here. They're all converging in the same body systems that allow you to digest your lunch and to stay alive. And also the anterior middle cingulate is another place. I'll just tell you really quickly. You could do a whole really cool lecture on the anterior middle cingulate. But basically, if you think about it, the cingulate there, if you can kind of imagine in 3D, is running right between the two insulas. So it's actually right under them. They're, they're acting as a network together next to each other in a 3D picture. What does this, what does this uh, area do? It's involved in sensing visceral pain. OK? If you have a stomach ache, something like that, right? It's also involved whenever you notice something surprising in the world, like, oh, whoops, oh, OK, right? It's involved in trauma. We have devastating papers showing that this region gets burned thinner, basically, in our teenagers in our experiment, the more violence they've witnessed in their communities. In the exact same location that we find happens in soldiers deployed as ground troops in Afghanistan which is, again, the exact same location that people with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, show thinning. 
What you're basically doing is <laughs> right all the time, every time you see something. Well, guess what? When you're doing a math problem and you go like, oh, whoops, that's not right. Same brain system. When you're reading something, you go, oh, wait, I didn't get that. Let me read that sentence again. Same brain system. How can you hear the little like, oh, wait, that math is, oh, I know how to do that. When you are worried about what's going on around you or when you have experienced instability in your relationships or, or social or physical pain in those relationships. This speaks two ways. First, it says you must, this is why you must feel safe to learn to write, right? It's also why things like learning to do math and to write can potentially be therapeutic for people who have experienced pain because they give you a safe space. If they're done in a way that you genuinely engage yourself, they give you a safe space to build control over those ideas that feels like you. Literally, it's tied into the regulation of your own consciousness and survival and pain and pleasure and all that. This is also the same region that, you know, if you get really thirsty, like you drink a you gulp a glass of water, right? Yeah, how, how do you know you're thirsty? Okay, you got your hypothalamus, which is also, by the way, engaged in emotion. Oops, sorry. Over here, okay? Which is reading, tasting the chemistry of your blood and saying, ooh, a little concentrated. I'm going to make you feel thirsty now, right? So then that makes you go out seeking something you need, like water. So you drink a glass of water. You down the glass of water, you don't feel thirsty anymore. But did you ever realize that water just hit your stomach two seconds ago? It's not already in your bloodstream thinning the concentration of your blood. How is it you don't feel thirsty? Because you've got your anterior middle cingulate up there doing a calculation for you, saying, okay, I, the blood is this concentrated. I've felt this much cool liquid going down over my throat. I think we're about done. I'm going to calculate that we're satiated now. I'm done, and you won't feel thirsty anymore, and I'm going to shut that down. The same regions of the brain that literally are controlling biological drives and appetitive like urges are the ones that are helping you to think about math. Right? No wonder these things come together. We are not Frankenstein monsters. Does that make sense? Okay. Do you want 30 seconds? Oh, wait, we only have five minutes. I can't give you 30 seconds. <laughs> all right, I'm going to show you the next thing, and then, and then we'll stop, and we'll talk over lunch. How about All right? OK. I told you at the beginning, emotional engagement's not all the same. Think back to, those, to the kids being like, oh, give me the lay, lay the points on, or whatever your name is, right? right? What, what's the emotion about? It's about the points. It's about getting it right, which is OK. That's not terrible. Right? But it's not great. It doesn't teach you civics. It teaches you how to be engaged in a game. All right? Okay? Compared to the emotion is about, what do I really care about? <laughs> right? What do I want to write about? What do I want to calculate compound interest about and use my quadrate equations for? Right? Those two emotions, those two kinds of emotions, are qualitatively different for one another. So here's, here's what. What we found, and I would show you and take you all through the data and let you discover it, except we don't have time, <laughs> okay? But you can watch, there's other talks online where I put stuff up where you can go watch them. What we found is that people activate systems in the deep middle of their head only for some kinds of thinking and not for other kinds of thinking. So think about this. Imagine the class at the beginning where the kids are like, oh, oh, I got the points, right? What is, both, that, that's emotional. What is the emotion about? It's about something you can see out here that you're attending to, you're engaging with, you're regulating yourself around, right? What is the emotion about in, say, the English class or the math class? The kid's saying like, okay, so uh, Mr. So-and-so, your house is going to cost you this much and here's how you pay it off over 30 years. There's emotion. Is the emotion about what's going on out here? Or is the emotion about something that you've constructed in your mind that doesn't exist in the physical reality? It's an idea. It's something that you understand. It's a future that you can conjure 
But, and even me, like demonstrating, I close my eyes. I'm like, it doesn't matter what it looks like right here on the paper. I'm thinking of a house over time and what it's going to mean for you. And I can't see that by opening my eyes and looking around. I have to build it in my mind. What we find is that these systems, which by the way are also deeply involved in building memory, okay, the kind, not the kind of memory for what we call semantics, not memory for facts like Toledo's in Ohio, okay, but memory for the time you visited Toledo in Ohio, right? What it was like and what happened and, you know, how you felt and what, you know. Memory for lived experience is tied to, coordinated with all this stuff, appetitive, pain, pleasure, all that, staying alive, breathing, all that, feeling your guts and viscera. When you tie all that together, what you get is this concerted mind state where somebody becomes engaged around an idea as compared to around something you can directly witness in the world around you, and the people around you. So let me push you forward. We're gonna, we could show how she does this, but let's skip ahead. Wait, where did it go? I had a picture here. Oh, it got lost. OK, sorry. Um, oh, there we go. There it is. Sorry. OK, so what it turns out, and again, I'm telling instead of showing, which isn't great, but it's all I can do in an hour, OK? Um, it turns out that what we see is that these networks, the balancing of the salience network is the guts, the viscera, the anterior cingulate, the <gasps> right, the stomach ache, all that, okay, is active all the time when people are engaged when they're thinking. But it's shifting the connectivity, the balance of the rest of those white sloshy things in the painting into different modes depending on the kind of emotion that's being experienced. When the emotion being experienced requires you to look out here, manage yourself, you know, regulate yourself, give a friend a hug, you know, watch out, the truck's coming over in your lane on the highway, okay, which really is super important. You have to do those things to be functional in the world. Then what happens is you are activating networks, what we call executive control. You need to manage yourself in the moment and watch what's going on. Make sense? But when your seesaw is needing to think about ideas that you can't see in the here and now. It's about trust. It's about community in the classroom. It's about what do I care about? That's not something I can see unless I'm two years old and then, it's, then it is. It's very concrete, right? It's my, it's my binky or whatever it is, right? But when you're 16, 17, what I care about is identity, is reforming the foster care system, is you know, making good art. Those are not things you can see. Those are stories you tell in your mind. When you want to think about that, the brain literally toggles itself into a network state in which you get executive control going, oh, this is hard, let's think about it. And then you tilt over into what we're calling this default mode network. We didn't call it this. It's been called this in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies. right? First discovered in 2001, first discovered in 2001 in experiments where, very clever experiments done at University of Washington where they put people in the scanner and rather than giving them things to react to, which is what they'd done all up to that point, like here's some math, here's some language, here's some movies, scary dogs, pornography, whatever, like and see like what happens to the brain, right? Instead they put people in the scanner and gave them nothing and just said like, hey, just daydream. Think about whatever you want. And what happens is, you know, think about nothing. What happens is at first, people are thinking, oh, I'm thinking about nothing, I'm thinking about nothing. Then you get these massive activations in these default mode systems inside the person, because there's nothing to look out on here, totally boring. Okay, I'm going to build something in my mind, right? And at first, that seemed like a real conundrum, because those systems in the brain use more energy and oxygen for unit space per unit time than the same size tissue in the middle of your thigh muscle is using in that much time in, a, in the middle of running a marathon, right? Extremely metabolically expensive tissue. And what are you doing when you're thinking about nothing? Of course, you're thinking about yourself. 
You're thinking about the future. You're thinking about relationships. You're replaying things in your mind. You're imagining possible things. You're thinking about historical context. Like, how did that happen? And then how does was she mad at me? Like, I wonder what that is, right? Does my grandmother want flowers for her birthday? birthday? I don't know. You know, you're playing in that space of things that aren't real. And that is what education can support you in meaningfully engaging with, especially for adolescents. I mean, all kids, but it becomes more and more. By adolescence, it is the driving force. It's what we care about is to be able to do that. So just to sum up, all right, you know, what does this idea mean, right? That the brain system that's, that allows you to think about deep, meaningful ideas and connect to the feeling of self can't be activated at the same time as you're watching out in the world and you're playing the soccer game and you're like, well, one, two, three, all eyes on me and the ball's coming and don't get hit in the head, right? What counts as regulated development is the ability to manage that seesaw dynamically, flexibly, in accordance with the needs of the context. If you're daydreaming when your teacher's giving you the instructions for the day, that's a bummer, right? That's not going to work out so well. But if you're out here trying to do, 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 right? You're not feeling the sense of you and self in that space that enables you to build what we call episodic memory, memory for having been there, memory that integrates what happened into who you are, into a possible future, a historical context, a deeper understanding. All of those things are things that don't exist in the world. You have to build them in your mind. If you don't feel safe, what is feeling unsafe, emotionally or socially or physically, heaven forbid, it's, oh my god, like what's going on around me? It's out here, right? That's why safety is so important for being able to build ideas. In the example, the English lesson or the math lesson. So just to sum up, these are cute things kids said, which are hilarious, but since we're out of time, I'll just say, you know, to take it back around, meaningful learning then, is learning that shifts the teachers and the students from emotions that are about outcomes or results to emotions that are about the ideas. And you can follow us on Twitter and get our new stuff whenever you want. Go to our website, pick stuff off for free, and thank you. Kept you from lunch. Okay. <laughs> do you want to do a turn of talk? Yeah. Do, do people want to ask questions? I'm happy to stay. I just don't want to keep you from lunch or or the the potty. You know. Sure. I can go back to any slide you want. So why don't we do this? Um, how about um, five seconds for anybody who no, no judgment who who wants to go start eating or wants to go potty, like to get up and go, and then questions. We'll ask questions. Okay. So five seconds. Go if you want to go, and then I'm going to go to the previous slide. This one. Yeah, okay. The one before that, too, sure. Got it? Okay, so are there questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, use your teacher voice, go for it. Yeah, that's right. Oh, so good. So, so this person says, she didn't hear me make the distinction between positive emotions and negative emotions. So here's the bottom line on that. What we find is that positive and negative emotion matters a lot when you're thinking about here and now. But what we found is that they become really remarkably integrated into these complex stories of meaning when you're in this transcendent space. I call it transcendent because it's not about the here and now. It's about something you've got to transcend the here and now and actually think about ideas. And negative emotion can be deeply empowering, right, to think about an idea. Social justice is predicated on negative emotion, right, you know, a lot of the time. And so it's not just about positive, happy stuff. 
That's not where learning comes from. Learning comes from engaging with the dimensionality of the deep, the depth of the meaning there, which could be negative or it could be positive. I mean, this is why we willingly engage in childbirth, right? Because the pain is for something. You know what I'm saying, right? It's all about the meaning you make, less than about the valence of it, is what I would claim. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we think of emotion as being happy. Now you can also think back of the first guy's class, right? It's all about positive stuff. But you know, many of those ideas, right, are actually fraught right now. How about engage with some of the negative stuff too as a way to hook, right? Because the complexity of the emotional landscape is what draws people in, not just positive stuff. You know, the idea of happiness, I think, is really a problematic idea in many ways because Happiness isn't really what makes us fulfilled. It's, it's, it's um, you know, meaning, right? Man's search for meaning, the book by Frankl, I mean, I think says this really well. People in the Holocaust, you know what I mean, who were interred in, in, in um, genocidal camps, right? What he noticed as, as, a, as a psychiatrist at the time is that the people who lived, I mean, obviously, as, aside from being directly murdered, right? But people who were able to keep themselves together were the people who were maintaining a sense of meaning about who they are as compared to losing themselves in the what's going on, right? Our mind is incredibly powerful, but the power comes not from positive things. It comes from the, 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 our ability to make complex emotional meaning, which can be painful meaning or happy, joyous meaning, and most of it is both at once. Yes. I wanted to try to ask a question, but it's going to take a little bit of context to frame it. Sure. So I just I ask for your grace. First, I want to thank you because uh, you feel like a breath of fresh air in education um, to be able to marry science that a lot of us weren't prepared to really think about the science of learning and the science of teaching. So I just want to honor you and, and honor the fact that you've come to share this time with us. And then I want to ask permission to, act, to sort of frame a difficult question. Um, Abraham Maslow was credited with this hierarchy of needs that he actually stole from the Blackfoot Nation and never really credit the indigenous people. And so those of you that will Google this and will look up Abraham Maslow and the Blackfoot Nation, you'll find a very different pyramid. And a lot of the work that you've been referencing is very powerful, but it makes me think about the work out of China from the I Ching and how really understanding both the mind and emotions is, is millennia long. And so I didn't hear evidence of that in your presentation. And then I think about Dr. Joy DeGroy's work with post-traumatic slave syndrome. And then I think about Resma's work with grandmother's hands. And then I think about Don Miguel Ruiz with the voice of knowledge and Mayan knowledge. And then I think about Dr. Yellowbird of neuro decolonization and indigenous mindfulness. Yeah. And my hope and prayer is that in your future talks, you will honor where this wisdom comes from. Thank yes, you. I love that. Can I, can I speak to that? So um, you're right, I should have uh, more explicitly framed that these, what, what I actually love about the science is that it's recapitulating things we've known for a very long time. But it's giving us new insights into, for example, the instrumental relationships between trauma and meaning and mental health. But the, the notion of understanding things in these complex ways is not new. And it's been around for millennia and, and has been recapitulated in various instantiations around the world by indigenous peoples in many places, by, um, by many traditions in religion and philosophy. Um, so yeah, I really uh, appreciate you, you saying that. We're not inventing this for the first time by any means yet. Yeah? You know, I, I was, the same things are going through my mind, but of course, if you were to uh, give credit culturally to the origins of this thing, that yeah. would take up most of your talk. Yeah. Uh, uh, Which says was, something too, I, I'm, right? I'm, I'm, I'm listening to it, and there was one part where you're talking about when you you put the people in the machine and you ask them to think about nothing, and then what results is what in Theravada Buddhism would be called monkey mind. Uh, that yeah, you know, and there's probably several other radiations of this. Uh, one thing, though, very simple. Could you please explain, because I, I, I didn't write it down, and I, it was like an almost an aha moment for me. Yeah. Uh, very simple. 
Uh, what, what, was, what is the difference between feelings and emotions? You touched sure. on that briefly, and I yeah, think yeah. that's very important. Yeah, it is really important. Um, it is really important. Um, so emotions we think of as the reactions you have to how, whatever you perceive, okay? So emotions are deeply subjective. They're, you know, whatever you notice that's worth reacting to, the way in which you react is an emotion. And there's not a clear boundary, right? These things bleed into one another. They're iterative cycles. But what I'm most interested in understanding is not people's immediate reaction. It's the way in which they then start to digest and make meaning out of what's going on. And so we call that feelings which are inherently cognitive and affective and related to self-awareness and agency all at once, which really cycles back to the, to the insights of indigenous perspectives, for example. So feelings would be the self-narrative. Yes, feelings are a kind of, I mean, self-narrative is a kind of feeling state, right? Which is why we care so much about it. Mm -hmm. It's not an isolated thing like I am a this. It's like I... I live a, as a this, right? And in experiencing that lived, you know, agentic sort of situated perspective, I construct a sense of self. On, on the wall in my office, I have a card that, you know, just um, highlights the, the South African saying, right, of Ubuntu, right? I am, you know, roughly translated, I am because you are, right? We construct ourselves in a cultural context of experience. <laughs> That's a batter battery issue, I think. Okay, so um, why is it such a, p a terrible punishment to put people in solitary confinement? Yeah. Right, why? Because you're, con you're deconstructing, you're, you're taking away the support for a person to construct who they are in that moment. You lose track of time, you lose track of self, you, you are less conscious in that state. And that is deeply problematic and painful to people. But then in other religious traditions and things like that, like certain Tibetan ones, right? People then learn to manage that as a way to construct an alternative sort of self. I mean, here's the thing. The moral of the story is the mind is incredibly powerful. And we leverage our minds in service of constructing what we are. And we can do that many ways. And that's what's happening in school. Whether we want it to or not, so why don't we attend to it? Yeah? Yeah? Amen. I know. I have a senior in high school right now. You know, right? It's that, it's that, it's that seesaw, which kids are really like, they're learning to manage it. Right. And, you know, so, I mean, I really think, and I'm just preaching to the choir here. I mean, some's better than none, but we need to rethink the way that we support kids by building out a context that enables them to engage deeply with complex problem solving. And you know, that's what this conference is about. That's what PBL is about, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Dr. Mary Helen and Mordino Yang. Thank you so much to everyone who I can see what you're writing. I'm hearing what you're saying to your partners. Thank you so much to everyone who spoke, who asked questions, who added insight and added value to the overall experience that we're all having together.